I'm Julia Adolph. I'm a composer and welcome to Loose Leaf Notebook. Today I'm thrilled to be joined by composer Sarah Kirkland Snyder. Sarah's works have been performed and commissioned by the New York Philharmonic, San Francisco Symphony, and National Symphony Orchestra, among many others. Sarah is the co-artistic director of New Amsterdam Records and has released critically acclaimed albums including Mass for the Endangered, Penelope, and Unremembered. We talk about Sarah's experience with her generalized anxiety disorder and major depressive disorder and how they impact her creativity. Sarah offers great insight into how to reclaim your creative self during tough times, how to seek support, and why it is so important for us to continue talking about mental health openly. Hi, Sarah. Hi. Hi, Julia. <laughs> Thanks for joining me today. Thanks for having me. It's such a pleasure to be here. I was so touched, as I think many were. Um, by your sharing publicly that you struggle with um, some mental health disorders, issues, whatever you want to call them. <laughs> so yeah, what kind of compelled you to share this at this time? It was kind of a spontaneous um, decision. I saw on social media that it was Mental Health Day, World Mental Health Day. I just thought I should say something because for one, I had just been diagnosed, re-diagnosed, I should say, um, with generalized anxiety disorder and um, clinical depression um, for, I don't know what number of times right. <laughs> it was that I'd been diagnosed with it again. It must've been like yeah. the fourth or fifth time. And I'd been dealing with a real, you know, struggling with a bout of depression um, over the summer. And at the, the same time, um, my daughter has Tourette's syndrome and, um, and she was in, in treatment for that. And um, I'd been working with her therapist that day and he'd been talking about how part of the, the treatment for Tourette's is educating other people in the patient's life about Tourette's syndrome. And instead of trying to hide Tourette's from the world, it's about teaching the world about Tourette's. And so, um, you know, he's saying that he wanted to come into her school and talk to her classroom to let everybody know about what my daughter is dealing with and making sure that all of the aides and the teachers and her friends understand Tourette's. And I just thought, what a beautiful way of thinking about an illness that is. And what a great thing it would be if every neurodivergent you know, disorder could be dealt with that way so that instead of feeling a sense of shame, the person could feel like, okay, this is just something that I deal with and everybody needs to learn to um, understand that this is a part of who I am and, and it's nothing to be afraid of and just to sort of accommodate it. And so I'd been thinking about that a lot and thinking about how um, we need to be, um, to feel no shame about who we are and we need to be um, out and proud about who we are. And so this World Mental Health Day <laughs> came up and I thought, yeah, I want to support that. And what's the best way to support that besides acknowledging that I too struggle with these issues and emboldened by my daughter's you know, diagnosis and struggle with Tourette's, I thought, yeah, I'm going to go out there and, and say this thing. And um, I got nervous for a second, but before I could chicken out, I hit post and... <laughs> Um, and then I stayed awake until three in the morning sure, and, thought, yeah. <laughs> and thought, oh no, what have I just done? But, you know, in the end, I was really glad that I did um, because you do have to be the change that you want to see. And, you know, it's not just my daughter. My, my son also has neurodivergent challenges. He's got epilepsy and migraines and um, sensory processing disorder and some anxiety and you know, dealing with my genes, who knows, my kids could both wind up having anxiety and depression. And, mm -hmm. you know, I want them to grow up feeling very proud of whatever challenges they're dealing with. Wow. So, um, so yeah, it's really, it was just really for my kids. It was really for them and for me. And, um, and I guess also for my grandfather and my mother, you know, um, mental illness runs in my family on both sides. My mother's father um, was bipolar and 
Um, she grew up in a small town in Tennessee and um, his bipolar illness became a very public struggle. Everybody knew about it. He had some manic episodes that were very embarrassing to the family, very public. Um, and she felt very stigmatized by his illness. And as a result, you know, with the best of intentions, um, she taught me to hide my depression and anxiety from the world. And, um, you know, so I think now as the world is trying, is opening up to the idea of destigmatizing these things, I really want to be a part of that as much as possible. Yeah. Thank you for so that's sharing. the long answer. <laughs> no, thank you for sharing all of that. I mean, it is true that it, you know, we forget sometimes these are genetic illnesses or disorders yes. and it can be hard because you're kind of sharing that this is potentially something that your family struggles with. Yeah, the anxiety and depression is on both sides, my mother and my father's side. Most of the devastation came from having to hide it. The alcoholism that resulted from the hiding and the shame and shame is such a toxic emotion. It is, I think, perhaps the most toxic emotion and we should never feel shame about who we are about the things that we can't control. It's like feeling shame about um, diabetes, you know, or blindness, or we would never feel shame about those things. Well, maybe yeah. it would be terrible if somebody did, but you know, it wouldn't, typically people don't feel shame about those physical conditions. We should not feel shame about mental conditions either because they are actually physical conditions they're physical imbalances in the brain they're chemical imbalances sometimes they can be caused by stress stressful situations in life but and i'm not a doctor it's hard to speak about these things yeah. as a doctor might but typically depression and anxiety are caused by you know neurochemical imbalances in the brain as you know i mean my depression and anxiety started in childhood mm -hmm. and um the you know my memories my earliest memories of anxiety and depression preceded anything stressful happening in my life it was just there it was just there like from a very very early age like eight and nine i have memories of really intense anxiety and and memories of depression you know that's that wasn't something that i chose for myself obviously so it's not something i should feel ashamed of um, it's just something that I have to to live with and, and navigate. The challenge, and this is what I talk about with um, my therapist, is um, learning to not see this so much as a disorder, but as um, the way that you know people now see learning disabilities as differently abled. Right. You know, like they're starting to understand that learning disabilities also come with you know, silver linings, you'll have different ways of learning that are advantageous. There are gifts that come along with anxiety and depression, you know, heightened sensitivities. And I'm not talking about the, the mad genius composer sensitivities, but, you know, sensitivities um, that you can harness to your advantage in certain ways in life. And that's the, that's the trick about managing anxiety and depression is saying, how does my brain work? You know, how does it help me? How does it hurt me? And, and trying to figure out how to harness the good and not see it as a blight all the time, but to see it as something that, that can be useful in some ways and seeing it as something that you can work with. Yeah, and perhaps even it's just another facet of your creative process that you need to take into consideration. You know, when is my, just like you think about when are you most energetic during the day? You know, you could think about yes. when am I most anxious during the day? And does that mean I'm, I am going to write or does that mean I'm not going to write? And, and is there something yeah. I can do to, um, to help that, that transition? Yes. Um, can you share a little bit about your your process from, you know, sort of feeling anxious and depressed at, as a child to where you are now, where you're saying it's, you know, you've been diagnosed several times? You know, I have been diagnosed several times, and yet I've often lived in denial a bit about it. Um, I've often sort of 
diminished it and played it down and not given it the attention that I should and um, sort of said to myself like, oh, it's okay. It's not that, it's not a big deal. So busy with work and I have two kids and I'm focused on taking care of them. And this is what happened this past year was I was so focused on everything else that I just didn't realize that I wasn't taking enough care of myself. And I should mention that um, I've suffered chronic migraines my whole life. And I had my neurologist prescribe um, my antidepressant. And it's always been sort of a, a chicken and egg situation where I have so many headaches all the time. The headaches um, make the anxiety and of course the depression worse. And sometimes it's hard to tell what's causing what. And so for the past three to four years, I was just sort of muscling through um, and slowly but steadily, my depression and anxiety were getting worse. And then um, the pandemic hit and I had the kids home 24 seven and um, everything was canceled. And I had no time or space or privacy to work. And I got very down and depressed and I had a headache every day and my mental health really started to suffer. We were all in the car one day and I was with my husband um, and the kids and I was on the phone with my neurologist and he was asking me his normal routine questions about my mental health and how everything was going. And Steve could hear everything because we were on speakerphone and um, the doctor was saying like, you know, how is your mood and our, your irritability and all of that. And I was just by rote going through everything saying, I'm fine, I'm fine, I'm fine. And then we got off the phone and Steve was like, what? Are, you're fine, you're fine, you're fine. You know, like you are far from fine. Mm -hmm. So I called back and I said, you know, actually I'm really not fine. And I was on the verge of tears and and I said, you know, I've actually been crying a lot and and I don't know why and I can't sleep and I'm having terrible insomnia. And, you know, and I said, I don't know why I didn't tell you these things, but I think I'm just, it's been this way for so long and this has started to feel like normal. And um, I've been a little bit in denial about this. And so he was like, okay, I want you to see my psychiatrist colleague. And so set me up with this appointment and, um, had this appointment with a psychiatrist and that's when he re-diagnosed me with um, depression and anxiety and put me on um, a different kind of medication. You can go through these periods of thinking that you can sort of outwit your, your anxiety and depression, or you can sometimes not even recognize it in yourself because if you're somebody who lives with chronic or with constant, if you if all you know really is a, a kind of low level state of anxiety and depression, then it's hard to tell what's normal and what's not, you know? It takes somebody else sometimes seeing you yeah. to tell you that you're struggling. In my case, that was my husband, you know, telling me and even my kids, you know, chiming yeah. in in the back seat saying like, yeah, mom, <laughs> you've been having a rough time lately, you know? Right. And um, so, so that was really, that was sort of my moment. Um, and it, it took a few months to get the, the meds adjusted, but it, it made a huge difference. And, um, you know, I really, it got me writing again. I stop writing when I'm really not doing well. Like yeah. for me, there's a really direct connection between, um, suffering and not writing, yeah. you know, like. I really don't believe in the, the tortured genius myth because when I'm really not doing well, I just, I can't write at all. And um, all of my, all of those troubling descants in my head completely take over mm -hmm. and I'm unable to write. For me, the medications really help me write and make it possible for me to be creative again. Um, but I feel like I'm talking too much. <laughs> Well, this is an interview with you. So, <laughs> You're saying you started medication at a young age before you started writing music? So, yeah. So my mother actually put me on medication for what she believed to be ADD, ADD when I was six sure. years old. 
Um, she thought, so my mother had profound learning disabilities, which she didn't recognize until she was an adult. And mm -hmm. I, you know, bless her heart. She thought she was doing the right thing. Um, she thought that I had them. It turned out that I do not. Um, I just had profound anxiety that made it difficult for me to concentrate. Right. Um, but she, she thought that it was learning disabilities. So she put me on um, this medication, Silert, which was this, at the time, kind of new kind of controversial um, stimulant, kind of like Adderall in the um, early 80s or late 70s, early 80s. She had our doctor put me on that when I was six. And um, it was a stimulant and, you know, a psychotropic drug, which actually made my anxiety worse and made my insomnia worse. And it may have made me more depressed. Um, who knows? But I was on that medication from the age of six until I was like, gosh, 18 or 19. And then I, my psychiatrist realized that I, when I had a bout of depression at 18, that psychiatrist, you know, diagnosed me with generalized anxiety disorder and said, you shouldn't be on this. But so I started composing when I was, um, gosh, I mean, if you count like making songs up in your head and singing things all the time, I started that when I was like four or five, but I started writing stuff down when I was six or seven. I was not a nerdy composer. Like, <laughs> I mean, I had no idea, no idea about the world of living composers as a job description. Yeah. Um, and neither did my parents. Um, I, I was obsessed with music, but I did it all on my own. And, um, just for fun for myself. And then I got serious about composition much later, but I had really bad OCD as a child. Um, I had to do everything in patterns. I had, I had to count everything. And weirdly enough, music was the one place where I did not, I was not obsessive compulsive. Wow. And I don't, yeah. And I don't know why that was um, because like with everything else, like even when I was coloring or writing, drawing, I had to like <laughs> do little dots and count things. And at right. night before bed, I had these elaborate rituals where I had to kiss my stuffed animals in groups of four and it would like keep me up at night and it was awful. But with music, it was like this total escape where I could just enjoy the music and I would just spend hours playing piano and improvising. And I was not obsessive compulsive at all. So I think it was, I associated music with this like free loving space, um, which I'm just sort of realizing now, actually, maybe that's why it was so heartbreaking when I got older and, you know, got into, um, got serious about studying composition and um, it became this space of like impressing I'm having to impress <laughs> certain teachers and you're not doing it right. And yeah. there are certain ways to do it. And um, if you don't do it this way, you're not good at it. And all of that, it was like, but wait, that's my special space. You know, this yeah. is my world and that belongs to me. And, but, you know, I took it back, <laughs> Right, right. <laughs> you know, I, I found my way back to it, but yeah, music was always this sanctuary, like mm -hmm. where I, I somehow, somehow didn't have this anxiety there. Um, but that said, you know, it became this world of tremendous anxiety as I got older. Yeah. And I, I don't want to underestimate that or diminish that. It's like a whole Greek tragedy every time I write a piece. <laughs> <laughs> like I've, I mean, it's, it's really excruciating for me to write music. Um, I'd love to say that it weren't that way. Sometimes I will get into a state of flow, like, mm -hmm. and that's usually like days before the deadline. <laughs> yep. But, um, <laughs> <laughs> and I love that. Like, I love the flow that happens like right before mm -hmm. the pieces do. And I have terribly unhealthy habits. I am very unregulated. It's awful for parenting because like, yeah. days before the deadline I'll be like up all night and but I'll be loving it I'll be in mad scientist mode and like it'll be awesome and and that's when ideas are flowing and it's so fun um 
but getting started on a piece is just torture for me. Does the anxiety increase when it's um, when, you know, when you're writing for the New York Philharmonic? I mean, of course, it's like that was a life. That's a lifelong dream to write right. for them, you know, and it felt like my whole career had been leading up to that moment. I just put all of this crazy pressure on myself and um yeah, I got way stressed out and all the migraines came storming back. But, you know, that said, like, I'm working on a song right now for a singer. You know, it's not the New York Phil and I'm still really stressed out about it. It's just the nature of the way my brain works. Um, right, right. And I think to some degree, I will always be this way. And um, I'm not sure what to what to quite do about it, except I haven't actually tried cognitive behavioral therapy yet. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah. So, so I might, I might try that. What do you do when you're having a really, um, tough day to, to try to get back into your creative space? I take walks in the woods. Um, and I do cardio. We have an elliptical machine in the house and I feel like that that also clears my head. I heard somebody say the other day that procrastination is part of their process. And I thought, hmm, that's an interesting way of thinking about it. I mean, maybe maybe it's something to be embraced and not to feel guilty about. I mean, it's so easy to procrastinate when all of us have so much email to respond to. Yeah. And there's so much administrative work involved with our careers all the time. You can always feel like, oh, well, I have to do that anyway. But my husband, for instance, never procrastinates he always wakes up first and does composing. He's very regimented with his composing and I admire that so much. Um, that's definitely not me. You're living with, uh, with Steve Mackey, your, your husband, and um, he also has an incredible career as a composer. It must be hard to, to not compare your own habits with his. It's really illuminating, actually. Um, it's really helpful. Steve is so great talking about all these issues. I call him my catnip. He's like, yeah. he's, so good at, he's so good at quelling all of my anxiety. Like I just have to like have two words with him and it like totally yeah. calms me down and chills me out. And there's just something about his presence in my life that is very calming. And like in terms of the composer, the tortured composer myth um, right. question, which as I think we can both agree on it's it's such a toxic uh, myth and um, it's funny Steve and I joke around a lot about this because Steve does not have any anxiety uh, disorder um, right. nor does he have depression but he sometimes has joked that he doesn't feel entitled to be a composer because he doesn't have those things <laughs> And he'll say like, you know, he jokes and he'll say like, I'm a golden retriever, you know? Like, <laughs> and he'll say like, I'm just a golden retriever. Like, you know, maybe I, maybe I shouldn't, maybe I don't have the right to be trying to, you know, illuminate the dark recesses of the human psyche or, you know, oh, is, yeah. you know, or whatever. It's like, first of all, Steve, the music just pours out of Steve. He is more prolific than any composer I've, I know he's like during the pandemic, he was just writing every day. He was constantly writing a new guitar etude mm -hmm. and he wasn't caring about whether or not anything was commissioned. He was just writing for fun. And that's how he composes. He's just constantly writing, you know, on the contrary, having depression and anxiety does not confer some kind of depth or artistic right. probity right. on what you write, you know? Yes. I mean, of course not. It doesn't mean that you have insight into the human condition. It's a complete myth. And I think it's very toxic, but it's toxic to both sides, you know, yeah. is, is the point. It's just interesting to see how, how different people can, can be like Steve and I are complete opposites. He doesn't judge himself. He just like gets in there. He calls it digging in the garden. He just like, whatever idea he comes up with, he doesn't care if he hates it. You know, he's like, if it's good or bad, I'll just mess around with it until I like it. Um, and I think that's so healthy and I envy that. I try to tell my students to do that too. Yeah. I wish I could do that. I have a hard time doing that. What is so anxiety producing about writing? 
Yeah, that's a great question. I love questions like this. It's like really getting to the point. Um, what is so anxiety producing about it? I think it's, it's you, you know that you're capable of coming up with something that you're in love with. You know that you're capable of that because you've done it before and because you've had those moments where you're like, yes, I love this idea. And you know you can do that. So you want to do that every time, right? Or at least I do. Yeah. And I, I don't like I don't like settling for anything less than that. And so I get frustrated if I can't nail that feeling. So that that's part of the problem. The other problem is that I often will hear this idea in my head and then it's like I start to lose it as I'm chasing it, trying to nail it down. Or I fear that I'm going to lose it as I'm trying to nail it down. I'll sing it, I'll describe it, but then I like avoid, I avoid sitting down to actually put it down. Are you afraid it's not going to be as good as what you hear in your yeah. head or you're going to distort it in some way? Yeah, exactly. It's like I now that I hear myself thinking out loud about these questions, they sound so lame and stupid. My fears. <laughs> They sound so ridiculous. I just want to be like, oh, just get the F over there. That's ridiculous. Just get to the piano and do it. That's stupid, you know? But it yeah. doesn't feel that way. And I don't know how much of that is just like a normal part of the creative process and how much of that is amplified by uh, anxious tendencies where like everything becomes scarier. I think that's inherent in the creative process for everybody. I think so. Again, Steve, the yeah, golden not for Steve. Yeah, <laughs> he's like so so chill. I don't know what it is right now. I I'm supposed to be. I mean, I am writing, starting to write this opera. It's something that I've been thinking about for like a decade, and I just feel I've put so much pressure on myself for it to be this magnum opus, and yeah. um, and I'm afraid of failure. I'm afraid yeah. that it, it won't be good. That fear is so intense that it's, um, it can be debilitating and it can make you not want to work on it. It's obviously more complicated, but it does boil down to this sort of primal fear of failure. It's totally lame. Yeah, no, I mean, I, I know what you mean. Yeah, it is. With anxiety, it can feel like like it, it, right in your body, like you go into fight, flight, or freeze. Yeah. Like it can feel like a, a life or death, even though it's not. Like it can just feel yeah. a lot bigger yeah. than it actually is. And so once you kind of strip all of that away, I think that's what makes it feel lame is because like you realize you're overreacting. Yeah. Um, but exactly. like that's part of the physiology of it. And that's yeah. like incredibly infuriating. <laughs> Yeah, but. yeah. Anytime that you can really, you know, unpack things, you know, and really get to the bottom of what's bothering you, it's so helpful. And that's why therapy is helpful. But I think journaling is can be even more helpful sometimes because mm -hmm. you just have that space to keep going and to really keep asking yourself, wait, but why and why that and why why that right. and keep you know trying to understand you mentioned that sometimes there are silver linings to different kinds of neurodivergence um so have you found any the the main thrust of my anxiety disorder is this fear that nothing i do is good enough you know the silver lining to that is that i'm very open to criticism and i listen i'm constantly editing and um, revising, I seek out a lot of feedback. You know, that's what I mean by criticism. I seek out a lot of feedback from yeah. players. You know, I'm very open to bettering my craft all the time. Um, I'm constantly trying to make my scores as, as strong as they can be. You know, it borders on OCD. I mean, it's, it is OCD <laughs> oftentimes, but, but at the same time, I think that caliber of of work has served me well in my career. You know, never feeling that you're good enough can be sort of a, a good, a good galvanizing force to keep pushing yourself to do better. 
as long as you, um, you know, keep it in check and realize yeah. that you are good enough. You know, you, you need to have that balance of self-validation. And that's what I'm working on is the, the inner self-validation. That's the hard part. Um, I think another silver lining though, is um, I'm a very sensitive person. And that's something that I like about myself. Yeah. Um, it's something that I'm proud of. You know, it's something that was not always good for me growing up. I think um, I, I was hypersensitive and I think I often put other people's needs ahead of my own in a way that wasn't healthy. But I think cultivating that degree of empathy was uh, was maybe also something that has served me well as an artist. I'm very interested in psychology and other people's feelings and you know, being attentive to other people's feelings perhaps has informed my my interest in narrative on some level or... Um, yeah. Are you very sensitive to light, noise? Like, is yes. it all your... Se- yeah. Like, growing up, I couldn't really even go to movies. It was just, like, way too much stimuli. One of the reasons why I, I procrastinate is because I do feel like sometimes I'm so... I'm so hypersensitive like all the time, a Mm -hmm. lot of the time, that sometimes the idea of like sitting down and consciously making this decision to be even more sensitive or more vulnerable or more emotional, it's just feels like too much. Totally. It's, it's, it's exhausting. And you feel like, oh, I don't have the emotional energy to do this. It's like, you, you feel like you need like, like some extended deep sea diving swimsuit to put on, you know, and you need like several hours of time to, to really get in there. Yeah. And, and I, um, I actually yeah. take a lot of naps um, because that actually kind of helps I do too. me reset. Really? Are you a napper? <laughs> yes. I, I have my moon pod over here. Yes. I nap on my moon pod in my study all the time. Do you ever consciously try to capture your experience with anxiety and depression in your music? I think in lots of pieces where I'm trying to channel an anxious state of mind, or then of course I'm channeling, you know, certain experiences that I've had. There was one piece um, where I was explicitly sort of actively trying to channel memories of childhood anxiety. Um, And that was this piece, Unremembered. It was a song cycle that I wrote um, Mm -hmm. um, with a friend of mine, Nathaniel Bellows. You know, so much of, so much of our music, it's like all of our life experiences are just ground up into this powder, you know, that's, it's hard to say it's like all of our life experiences are in our music, but it's so finely ground. It's hard to point to sure. any one moment and say, oh, that's this experience or that, but it's it's all there. Do you think there's a place in conservatory to yeah. have these conversations? Yeah, I absolutely think there's a place for it. I think it's really important, actually. As we've discussed, you know, there's so much anxiety that goes into the creative process for a lot of artists. And there's so much anxiety that gets in the way of composing. And it's hard to sometimes talk about composing without talking about these issues. I mean, these were conversations that I never had with my teachers, um, but would have been grateful to have because it's so inextricable from the creative process. My first year at Yale, I, um, I had a really bad case of writer's block when I first got to Yale and I, I was very, I was very, very intimidated to be there. I was the only female in the program, um, like teacher or student. And I was super intimidated and I just couldn't write. I couldn't get over my anxieties. And um, I was working with one teacher and I was talking to him about this and he was really angry with me. And um, he actually threatened to kick me out of the program instead of, you know, like saying, well, let's talk about why you're feeling this way or whatever. He said, you know, we could have given this spot to somebody else who would, who would write, you know, like if you don't get writing, you know, you're not welcome back here next semester. And I wound up having like a panic attack and my migraines exploded and I wound up in the hospital and it was, it was awful. 
it was awful. But, you know, if I had been able to talk to him in a way that was healthy, that conversation could have gone in a much healthier direction, obviously. Um, and so I think about this a lot and I have some students that I see and when I talk to them and they bring up issues that they have, I make sure to go out of my way to spend time talking about these issues um, because it's really important to me that they feel comfortable and cared for um, emotionally and that they feel like, you know, that somebody understands where they're coming from and that they feel supported because we all need that support and we especially need it from from our mentors because they we all need to know that it's normal to feel these ways and that it, composing is hard and it's a struggle a lot of the time and i know that my husband feels the same way that i do about this and he talks to his students about these issues too he often jokes that he's you know part-time composer composition teacher part-time therapist and, <laughs> and you know we all need these um se sessions like or, yeah. or composition lessons where they're it's not just about composing, but it's about philosophy and talking about the bigger picture and how we approach composing, how we approach the creative process, how we approach our brain. Um, we all need that kind of advice. So I absolutely think it's really important that this be a part of the, the uh, pedagogy of teaching. I think too often students can feel alienated from composing otherwise, because yes. it's, it's hard and scary enough as it is. Yes. Yeah. And I think you your story raises another really important fact, which is that, you know, talking about mental health or learning how to talk about creativity in a more sensitive way will actually diversify the field because there are people who are feeling left out. And it's just it's like the issues compound on one another. Why, why should you have felt comfortable at Yale, regardless of whether you had a, a disorder or not? You know, why, why, why would you have felt comfortable there unless the professor was making an effort to, to help you feel comfortable? Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah, yeah. I don't <laughs> <laughs> that was a, that was a, that was a, a tough year, but, um, yeah, but it, it made me tougher. We just need much more of this. And I think, you know, my generation and I sense that a, a lot of my peers who are teaching are hip to this and are, you know, doing more of this, you know, like talking with their students openly about these issues. And I mean, I see these conversations even happening on Facebook and mm -hmm. on social media, and it's so different from you know, the way that I grew up with my teachers, like with this weird divide and everything is just about craft and you don't talk about any personal issues or process or, right. um, so all of that is so much for the better. I just, I just think, I think we can go even more in that direction and yeah. conversations like this, you know, projects like yours are, are so helpful and, such a great thing for our community and thank you you know yeah well i always ask my guests this it feels a little silly asking you this but um <laughs> if people want to find you and hear your music where can they go oh sure <laughs> <laughs> i'm at sarah kirkland snyder.com um and Bandcamp and New Amsterdam Records, Spotify, Apple Music, all that stuff. Thank you so much for doing this. It's been oh. really powerful just for me personally. And I think a lot of people will be inspired by what you have to say. Oh, thank you so much for having <laughs> me. It's really been a pleasure. You make it so easy. It was, it was really an enjoyable conversation. I'm so grateful to Sarah for being so open and honest and painting a very clear picture of what it's like to live with generalized anxiety disorder and major depressive disorder as an artist. I know I certainly identified with basically everything she said about generalized anxiety and um, it was very comforting and inspiring to me personally 
to hear uh, what Sarah had to say. And so I hope that you found that as well. Um, thank you so much for being here and thank you for listening. <laughs>